Morning, everybody. Uh, thanks, Des, for that introduction. Uh, I feel uh, slightly overwhelmed by that. Um, it's, I think it's a real honour to be stood here today, so uh, to speak about a river that, well, so many of us here today love. Um, I mean, it goes without saying that it's something that we've got to cherish and protect, and we must never take for granted the fact that it's, it's going to be there uh, in years to come, uh, as it is. Uh, to many of us, uh, not just me, the rivers, it's not just, it's not just a barbell river, it's an artery running through a big part of our lives. We, um, and as many, many, many people have loved the river uh, and love it uh, both past and present. Um, but, um, and we all know a bit about the seven, but none of us have got all the answers. So whatever I say today, somebody will probably find, uh, will totally disagree with. But we've all, we're all just parts of a puzzle and trying to put it all together. Um, where are we here? Um, there's three parts to the seven, obviously, the upper, the middle, and the lower. And I've always considered that the lower seven is simply the navigable seven from Starport down to Gloucester. Most of my fishing has been between Tewkesbury and Gloucester, but I have caught barbel as far up as Atcham, near Shrewsbury, and as far down as Lanthony Weir at Gloucester. Um, the lower rivers split between into five different impounded sections and they all contain the same general characteristics of the shallower, faster water upstream and the deeper, slower water downstream. And although today, you know, most of my talks about the, the Worcester to Tewkesbury section, whatever I say today is equally applicable to these other sections. I, to be honest, when I moved to Tewsbury in 1972, I didn't like the look of the Lower Seven at all. It was much too big and featureless compared to the, the Warwickshire streams of my childhood. So in those days, what fishing I did was on the smaller local li rivers, uh, the River Team, the River Chelt, the River Leaden, uh, mainly chub fishing. But <coughs> in time, I did eventually catch uh, my first barbel off the team in 1973. However, by, uh, by the mid to late 70s, I was up on the middle seven like hundreds of other anglers catching three and four pound barbel. Um, but as a, as a budding specimen hunter, uh, I was looking for bigger fish. And with the Hampshire Raven uh, miles away, what other options were there locally? And it was sort of driving 30 or 40 yards, uh, 30 or 40 miles up to the middle, ri uh, ri middle River along the Seven Valley. I couldn't help wondering how many barbel I was driving past. Uh, and eventually it was a, an article by Barry, uh, the match angler Barry Brooks in Angling Times, which put me onto the Lower Seven when he mentioned, if you want some good barbel, try, go and have a look at Seven Stoke. Um, and in June 1979, uh, I made a start. Uh, now, it's widely known today that June is not a good time of year on the Lower Seven. And so it proved. Uh, ten hours later, I packed up uh, without having had a bite. Well, I was fishing sweet corn that day, so that's probably not surprising. Uh, and over the next two years, I probably did 15 or 20 trips to Seven Stoke here, uh, mainly fishing upstream opposite the cliffs. I caught lots of fish, uh, but I didn't catch any barbel. The trouble was, uh, there was nobody else fishing for them. There was no, uh, uh, and I wasn't confident that what I was doing was uh, the right methods, I was in the right place. Uh, and when I was talking to uh, uh, matchmen or pleasure anglers, the, the usual response was, oh, you want to go up to Beardley or Bridgedorf? Uh, there's loads of barbel up there. Um, Eventually, after two years at Sevenstoke, um, my mate uh, Roy Greenwood and myself, more by luck than judgment, we found some, some barbel above the, the big bend at Ucking Hall down, down of Ups, uh, Upton. Uh, and it would be another 18 years before I returned to Sevenstoke. We were still using typical middle seven tactics at the time, swim feeders, six pound line, size 12 to 14 hooks, uh, maggots and casters, um, 
we tried worms for bait, we, uh, we caught eels, we tried corn, we caught nothing. But surprisingly at that time, we didn't actually try meat. Um, however, once we started catching uh, a few barbel, and in those days, you know, a seven pounder was a big fish, um, uh, we became so secretive, um, we wouldn't actually admit that w what we were fishing, we were fishing for barbel, although looking at this photo today with me rod up in the air, uh, who, do I, who, do, who do I think I was kidding? Um, this is Saxon's Load, um, it's just below Upton on Severn, um, and to avoid a long walk at Ucking Hall, uh, up to the bend, we started using uh, Saxon's Load as access. Um, it was 50 pence to park the car in the field, and with any luck, Rebecca, the extremely well-endowed farmer's daughter, would answer the door. And trust me, that was worth 50 pence alone. Um, Saxon's Load's uh, an interesting piece of water because it's the last relatively shallow area of the Lower Seven, uh, and from here down to, down to Tewkesbury, uh, most of the middle of the river is anything from 16 to 24 foot deep. Whereas here, um, much, of the, much of the far side of the river is probably only six or eight foot deep, uh, and then there's a central channel where it's 11 foot deep. And what I've always found interesting is, you know, the old Anglo-Saxon word uh, load means a crossing place. And I've always envisaged that there probably was a crossing place here uh, on the river. Um, I mean, what you have to bear in mind is that when the weirs were installed, they probably put another five or six foot of water um, uh, onto the height of the, of, of the riverbed. So, you know, in a, in a low summer, uh, before the weirs were installed, there would probably be any five foot of water there or so. And what I find interesting is how Barbel, even though the river's been changed by the, the, the weirs, etc., they're still drawn to those areas, which are, you know, traditional fords on the river. Uh, another example of an area of shallow water that Barbel always seems to turn up on is the well-known Pixon Ferry. Um, um, but in the early 1980s, um, it, was, it really was only the Wessex rivers that offered a realistic chance of catching double-figure barbel. So, you know, in the, this was in the early 80s, 1980, 1981, 82. Uh, to be catching large numbers of seven, eight, nine-pound barbel, it really felt like we'd discovered paradise. I mean, we were regularly catching 10 to 25 fish or more in a day on the lower seven. Uh, very much like the fishing on the Y is today. Um, it was all daytime fishing, um, initially with maggots and casters, but in those days the, the bottom of the lower seven was paved with bootlace eels, so we were always looking for other baits to use. Um, we always tended to fish particles, and we quickly found that we could catch uh, a lot of fish on uh, initially on legend tears, uh, which worked uh, in, well, and also we found, you know, what, once you put enough bait in, that uh, we can catch the fish on sweet corn. Um, those fish continued to grow through the 1980s. Um, I didn't have a double out of the seven until the late 80s. But um, by the mid 90s, uh, it was established as probably the premier uh, big barbel fishery in the country at the time. Uh, it probably peaked in the late 90s with um, uh, Howard Maddox's record fish, and it's sort of been rolling along since. It doesn't seem, the, fish don't, the growth in fish doesn't seem to have kept up with uh, the growth of barbel in other rivers, but uh, it's still rolling along. Um, I wasn't on my own in those early days. Uh, Roy Greenwood, my mate, uh, was fishing with me from the start. And within a couple of years, uh, Mike Burden and his son Richard moved to Tewkesbury, and they soon started making inquiries about the barbel on the Lower Seven. Naturally enough, um, keen to protect the, the fishing that we'd uh, discovered, we rather sneakily suggested to Mike and Richard that they go up to Diglis Weir and try up there. Uh, sure enough, uh, uh, poetic justice was served when Richard promptly caught a 10-pound barbel off, off Diglis, which was... Uh, something neither Roy nor I had caught at the time. Um, 
what I would say about this, this picture is make the most of your time. Um, uh, enjoy every day fishing because you don't know what's around the corner. Uh, sadly, Mike is no longer with us at the boat. Uh, he died a number of years ago. Uh, Roy's in, um, he's got dementia and he's in a care home and uh, Richard has moved away and does very little fishing. I'm still here, of course, um, uh, but I'm getting too old to be falling out of trees, as you can see. Like, um, there's, there's lots of successful seven barbel anglers uh, over the years, uh, but my restless nature means I've always wanted to find out what swims are on, on the next bend or in the next field. Uh, so over the years, I can honestly say I've, I've caught barbel from virtually every field between Worcester and Tewkesbury. My weakness, uh, if you can call it that, is I love catching barbel. I love catching loads of barbel. Uh, and uh, the trouble with catching lots of barbel, it does reduce your chances of catching the bigger fish. I mean, again, I learned that off Mike Burden in the 80s. Um, I'd be persisting with my feeder and particle approach and Mike would be patiently fishing lumps of meat and consistently catching fewer but bigger fish than me. But at the end of the day, does it really matter? We're all fishing for pleasure. Um, we make a fishing what we want to. Um, before talking about the specifics of location, the one thing I, I think you need to have on a featureless river is confidence in your methods because if you're not confident that you can catch barbel with the methods then there's always going to be that doubt in your mind am i in the right place or is it the methods are, or my methods are wrong so having assumed that i am confident with my methods i simply assume that if i'm not catching fish if i haven't seen barbel roll uh, or i haven't seen or heard of other anglers catching i simply assume that there's no barbel in the area and i'll start looking for other areas and and that's the thing i would say is that i'm not looking for swims on the lower seven i'm looking for areas and these areas could be anything from 100 yards long to half a mile or more uh, the one thing i think they have in common is that there's always an increase in current speed around those areas again dick walker uh, reckoned he could identify a, a, a barbel swim on the hampshire raven years ago purely by looking at the speed of the current. And I think that's certainly true of the lower seven, and it's probably true of, uh, of uh, barbel rivers all over the place. They, they do like, um, current speed is everything for a barbel, I think. Um, but having found an area that I think is suitable, um, so you're looking for areas that uh, typically on the outside of bends where um, the current's deflected, uh, where it's concentrated, areas where the river narrows, or areas where the, uh, the river shallows. All of these areas will cr create that increase in current speed that barbel like. And, and like I say, I mean, you know, there are good swims that are snags and that, but I don't think primarily that a barbel is in an area because there's a snag in the area. I think it's the current speed that comes first. Um, Des always tells a story about the first time he fished the lower seven and with a gale force wind blowing upstream um, he couldn't tell which way it flowed well knowing Des uh, that was very much probably tongue-in-cheek uh, but he makes a valid point uh, at normal levels it is very sedate and it's, it's in some areas particularly lower down the river it can almost look still uh, when they're in a in the late summer but a foot of water on the river and she starts to show her character. Um, I think as river anglers, we can all see the, the current sweeping around the inside, the outside of the bend, sorry, uh, and the steadier water on the inside. Um, this is, um, as a lot of you will know, uh, this is Seven Stoke looking upstream from the car park. And it's often cited that um, Seven Stoke is a good area because lots of barbel, uh, because lots of bait goes in there. I don't think that's quite the case. I think more it's a case that um, the barbel, barbel like the area uh, around Seven Stoke. They like the way the currents pushed over on that sweeping bend, and then the river narrows slightly through the car park. It just gives them the the uh, the, the river conditions that they prefer. Uh, and the fact that it's easy access and lots of people fish there just makes a good 
an area that Barb will find attractive even more attractive. Um, so it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. My summer fishing has always been rather static. I'll find an area that uh, uh, I'm confident I've got barbel in. Uh, and my fishing is, tends to be afternoon, evenings, and I'll fish an hour or two into dark, um, depending on the time of year. Um, I, you know, having found an area with barbel, um, or with, I'm confident with barbel, I, my, then, my, my tactic is usually to fish a couple of swims and bait them and uh, fish them in rotation. Uh, but I have noticed over the last 20 years or so how um, the, the preponderance of pellets and boilers going into the river does seem to have concentrated the fishes onto those more heavily fish stretches. 20 years ago, there were a lot more opportunities, I thought, to pioneer on the river and go and find your own fish. Um, back in the days when most of, us, uh, most of us were using hemp and luncheon meat, uh, it wasn't such an effective way of baiting, particularly in the winter months. Um, so I do feel sadly today that um, quite often you can go looking for your own private bit of water, but quite often, a lot of the time, the fish are on the most heavily fished stretches of a river, purely because of the bait that goes in. Um, I've got a feeling that fish favour returning to... Uh, the same areas year after year. Uh, I've caught repeat captures uh, from the same stretch uh, over a period of years, and then the fish have disappeared. But it does change, um, you know, uh, low water flows, uh, heavy baiting, um, uh, and just the natural migration of the fish will cause the fish to move around the river, uh, and they won't always be there all the time. Um, this is, um, this is opposite Beach and Court. Um, it's just above Kempsey. Um, I got permission from the, um, from the uh, caravan site at Seabourn Leisure to fish in their field above them. Uh, and I had some decent fish off there for two or three years. Uh, what I did find, find with this area, though, was um, I'd be fishing it in July and August, catching a few fish. Uh, but there were areas downstream of me, notably at Pixham or Cleveland, and upstream of me at Diglis, which were fishing better than there uh, in July and August. However, come September uh, and in, in, into October, then I started catching more bigger fish than I had, than I had been catching. And what, it, what that showed to me, uh, and it's happened... It's happened um, before, but it just demonstrated again, is that there's different areas on the lower seven, and some areas will fish better in the summer months, uh, and, and, and then as the river changes, as there's more flow in the river, then they'll start to move to other areas. And those areas might be a, a few hundred yards away, they might be four or five miles away, or even further. Um, so you need to be bear in mind that although you're catching in the summer months in one area, it might pay to have a look upstream or downstream for other areas where you might find the fish tend to prefer to be in a different part of the river at that time of year. My winter fishing has always been mobile. I'm sort of, I consider myself hunting rather than trapping. Uh, and I tend to fish different venues according to uh, how the river conditions are. So some venues or fish better with sort of two or three foot of water on. And other venues like this, which is the bottom end of Upton Ham, only really fish uh, when there's a lot of water on. It's not an area where I've caught uh, any great numbers of barbel from, or even any particularly big barbel from. But it's an area that when the river's like this, half a mile or more wide, I know I can go and catch a couple of fish in the evening. Um, in the, originally, all my winter barbel fishing was simply one rod, a lump of lunch of meat, and a maximum of 20 or 30 minutes in a swim and move on. In that way, I'd probably fish a dozen or so swims in an evening. And my rule of thumb back in those days when I smoked was uh, one cigarette per swim. And more often than not, if I was going to get a bite, it was before I'd finished the cigarette. They are that quick onto the bait uh, when, you're moving, when you're fishing mobile and you give them what they like. Um, as I've got older, I'm not so mobile, and it's not just because of a cigarette. Um, 
But uh, again, you don't need to fish mobile with just lunch meat. Uh, it works equally well with lumps of paste. I've even done it with um, using boilies uh, and a cage feeder. And you might not be able to move your bait around the river quite the same, uh, but you can certainly sort of have one chuck in a swim with a cage feeder, uh, a, a nice smelly piece of lunch meat, uh, boily, sorry. Uh, and more often than not, if you're going to catch a barbel, you'll catch it within 20 minutes, half an hour, if the conditions are right, that is. This is the mouth of a team looking down to Carrington Bridge at normal summer levels. Um, the team, the river team enters from the right and Diglis Weir is a mile upstream to the left. Um, it is the main spawning area on the lower seven. Um, I've always been frustrated by the poor access around here because, for example, much of the east bank, you can't, uh, much of, I think there's only two fields between Diglis and... Kempsey that are, are, are freely available to fishing and on the West Bank it's there's a lot of long walks uh, and St John's which own the stretch downstream here is obviously only open to those with a, a, Worcester, postal, a Worcester postal address um, but the majority of the uh, lower seven fish undoubtedly spawn in the team uh, however some fish do spawn in Diglis Weir and how the, the, they, they split between the, um, uh, the two rivers is not really uh, something I, I, I can explain. But uh, one thing I would say is, although they do use these areas of the river uh, to spawn in, uh, I, I believe that they, at times, migrate much further than this at times. Uh, and the reason I think that is because you get poor seasons on the lower seven, which are often preceded by cold, wet weather at, at spawning times. Uh, and so when the weirs disappear in a big flood in March or April, um, do the fish, instinct, you know, when they're hanging around below Diglis or below the mouth of the team, do they, the fish instinctively start moving upstream, looking for better conditions, taking them over the Poet Weir or Diglis Weir even, um, and then when they're above those weirs and the conditions change and they find that they, they can spawn in comfort, um, are the fish now stuck above these weirs and then they need um, extra, extra water in the autumn to get back over their weirs to the normal uh, autumn and winter haunts. Um, I mean, so often on the lower seven in years gone by, There'd be, there'd be some appalling uh, summers fishing on there when there hardly seemed to ho fish in the lower seven. And then the first flush of water in the autumn, suddenly the whole river would be fishing. Um, I think that probably a lot of fish had got stuck above the weirs and then you get some water in uh, that lets them get back over the weirs and further down, down to uh, their normal autumn and winter haunts. Um, sadly... Sadly, the team isn't the river it was 20 years ago. I mean, 20 years ago, the lower team was, uh, I would say there was a shoal of barbel under every willow bush. Um, what I, uh, is certainly not the case now, and I'm sure otters have had a, a dramatic effect on, uh, on, the, on the lower team, um, not necessarily killing the, uh, the barbel so much as driving the, uh, driving the barbel from the shallow water and back into the, uh, into the deeper water of the lower seven. And what impact that has on, the, lower, uh, on the, the successful spawning of those barbel, I don't know. But uh, it is worrying because there are less fish, there are less barbel in the seven catchment and the team catchment than there were 30 years ago. 30 years ago, um, I can remember when there was a lot of talk about recruitment issues on the, on the, on the Wessex rivers. And I re distinctly remember thinking at the time, oh, we'll never have that problem on the seven and the team. There's loads of barbel up here. Well, um, there's not as anywhere near as many barbel as there were 30 years ago. So although the problem isn't looming large yet, it is on the horizon. Um, I, I don't think otters um, uh, are the sole issue. I mean, there does seem to be, you know, again, 30 years ago, you used to catch loads of little barbel in, the, in both the team and the seven. Um, you don't seem to catch them now. Um, so maybe there is a problem with barbels successfully spawning. 
and maybe otters do interrupt that successful spawning. It's just one more, one more nail in a potential coffin. Um, this is the mouth of a team with 12 foot on, and I've often imagined a big back end barbel coming out here, uh, certainly living around here. However, the water coming out of a team uh, is often colder than the seven in the winter, and I've not found it as consistent a spot as I would have thought. Um, but I've had some good fish off here, um, several 12s, but nothing any bigger than 12. Uh, and it's always worth a, an hour or so at that time. Um, I've noticed also that uh, when the river's this high, that the, the, uh, the team, the water coming out of the team causes the seven to back up at this point. And you get a lovely area of steady water for about three or four hundred metres above the confluence here, uh, which looks ideal. And, you know, at times I've fished a four ounce lead right away across the river and held quite comfortably with, when the river's that high. However, sadly, it hasn't produced the fish that I always feel that it should, that should be hanging around there. Um, <clears throat> winter fishing. I've always considered the seven a more consistent winter fishery than summer fishery. As I said, um, the, some summers, the seven can seem devoid of fish, certainly below Kempsey. Um, but so I could... So, uh, the seven is a very consistent uh, winter fishery. Um, this is a free stretch at Ripple, when what I consider ideal winter condition, uh, which could be anything from two to six foot of water on, uh, uh, steady with a good colour. I don't like it when it's rising fast, uh, although there have been some very big fish caught when it is rising fast. I don't like it when it's falling fast. Um, but the advantage of a lower seven over rivers like the Warwickshire Avon or the, or the Wye is that it can remain in, a, in, a, in good conditions for, for days and at times even weeks, uh, which obviously makes it a lot easier to time your, your trips in the winter. Um, my perfect winter conditions is just after the river has stopped rising, um, the flood water rubbish largely stops. Uh, Obviously, late autumn is the worst time of year uh, for leaves and other rubbish coming down. Um, I, I like fishing it when it's top of the bank. Um, as, we, as anybody who's fished the lower seven in the winter, uh, when it's low, it's, it's, it's quite dangerous sliding down the bank. Uh, when, you, when it's top of the bank like this, uh, you can sit in the field. You can even, you can even beach fish in the long grass by, uh, you know... Um, um, the other thing I've noticed about the seven, the lower seven, when it's uh, when it's up, right up as high, and it's top of the banks, I've, I've noticed that as it starts to burst its banks, the river actually slows slightly. And what I think it's caused by is, as you get to the top of the banks, it widens slightly, and just that little bit of wider uh, widening of the river just makes it slow down. So when it's when it's coming up, uh, it's, it seems to be pushing through all the way along the river. And then when it's almost bursting the banks, it actually seems to slow down slightly. Um, the other thing I would say about a high river is I've always liked fishing the first frost on a high river, and I've had a, a lot of good fish uh, on a high river, uh, even, what, even on days when I've got out of the car and there's been ice in the puddles. Um, whether the barb will uh, anticipate the drop in temperatures, I don't know. But uh, su suffice to say, if there is a, is a high... The first frost on a high river, it doesn't put me off at all. Um, but when it's halfway up the flood bank, it's maybe too much of a good thing. And 20 years ago, uh, I, would, I would never admit to feet whatever the height of the river. Um, but, you know, when you're halfway up the flood bank and you're casting 10 or 20 yards to get your... Uh, to get your your, your bait in the river proper, you, you do end up snagging a, top, a lot on the top of the near river bank. So these days, unless I can get close to the uh, edge of the main river, I, I don't usually bother when it's fishing that high. But on that particular day, we, uh, we were caught out with no other options. Um, the other thing I've noticed on uh, when you get uh, big floods, uh, and quite often this is the case on... Uh, the first big flood after a, period, a long period of dry weather, which it might be in the autumn or it might be the first big flood in the spring. 
uh, you often get a lot of barbel rolling all over the river. Uh, and, and I... I wonder, are those barbel actually feeding or are those barbel travelling? Because I'm sure that there are floods uh, on the Severn that, that uh, stimulate the barbel into moving. Uh, it just seems odd to me that you know, a barbel that's feeding 20 or 25 foot down would come up to the top of the river and roll uh, and then go back down to the bottom of the river and, and, and carry on feeding. And it's not to say that when there are lots of barbel rolling, there aren't barbel feeding on the bottom. It's just that when, they are, when you are seeing fish rolling like that, it does make me wonder whether they are moving. Um, because as I'll show you, uh, hopefully show, I've got a couple of examples coming up. There have been times when uh, moving to where fish have just moved, uh, have moved to has paid off for me very uh, successfully. Um, but I've always loved the instant results of flood water fishing. And, and if, you, uh, if you put a, an acceptable bait near a fish in those sort of conditions when the river's coloured, it never ceases to amaze me how quickly they're onto the bait. Um, this is 1999, and it saw my first visit to Seven Stoke in 18 years. Uh, I'd been on the bank less than an hour, and it was probably my second or third swim I'd fished. And this first ever fish from Seven Stoke is still my biggest fish from Seven Stoke. Uh, ironically, it was in the, exactly the same area where I started fishing for them 18 years earlier, which shows how easy it is to be in the, wrong in the right place at the wrong time on the lower seven. It remains uh, a very memorable fish, as much as anything with the sight of a big barbel plowing up and down in the field alongside, uh, with all, all through all the nettles and the... Uh, and the grass stems. Um, the, one thing I, the other thing I would like to say about uh, big floods is when there are really big floods and, and, and the river's bursting its banks, I try and avoid fishing stretches with lots of willow bushes uh, because, in my opinion, uh, whereas on a, on a smaller river you'll get uh, a nice crease behind a, a willow bush uh, and it's an obvious place to fish uh, to put a bait, uh, on the lower seven, when you get a big flood, these, these big willow bushes that you get on the seven seem to cause a hell of a lot of turbulence. So you might be fishing 20 yards downstream of a willow bush, and one minute your rod will be bent double, straining, and then, then the next minute the, rods, the, the line's uh, hanging slack from the rod tip. And, uh, and if that sort of turbulence is, is being repeated at the bottom of a river, I'm sure that barbel don't like living in that sort of area. So... When, a, when there is a big flood, uh, I try and avoid fishing stretches with lots of, uh, lots of uh, overgrown willow bushes. The other thing is, of course, you've always got the bow in your line going down into the next willow bush down. And, of course, when you hook a fish out in the flow and if it goes right running downstream, you're going to have a, a problems getting it back. Uh, as a generalisation, I would say there's much, too many uh, overgrown stretches on the seven these days since... Uh, since the, the angling clubs seem to have given up on the, on the, on the seven. Um, um, but, uh, yes, yeah, so I'll move on. Um, after work, when I was uh, working, I, I mean, I, I ran my own sandwich business for 25 years, and that was purely so I could finish work at three o'clock every day and go fishing as often as I could and remain married uh, at weekends. Um, so, you know, 20 years ago, I'd go weeks in the winter without seeing a fish in the dark. Uh, and you start to, you start to con convince yourself that you need to fish after dark to catch barbel uh, in the winter. Um, but if you start fishing uh, an hour before dark, it does become a self-fulfilling self prophecy and you will catch the majority of your fish after dark. As, as I've got older uh, and I've got more time, I can, I can, I can go earlier in the day and mine. And I, to be honest, I, I don't enjoy fishing after dark so much now as I used to. Uh, and I think I just appreciate, I prefer appreciating the fish uh, in the daylight more. Um, I think you might need more patience to catch fish in the daytime. You might need to adjust your baits. You might need to go down the size of your baits. Uh, but you, they certainly feed in the daytime. Uh, again, going back to Mike Burden, Mike uh, caught a lot, a lot of big barbel off the lower seven, and I would think the vast majority of them were caught in the daytime. To me, 
the ultimate challenge is understanding the river and understanding what the fish are doing, not catching X numbers of double figure fish. And the one thing that's always interested me on the lower seven is their migration up and down the river. Uh, there's obviously a post spawning movement down the river, uh, which obviously depends on successful spawning and often coincides with extra water in the river. That might be in July, it might not be until September. Uh, but there's also a pre-spawning movement up the river, uh, which I think is initially stimulated by the, um, the increase in daylight hours as, uh, as the clocks turn after Christmas. Uh, and, I mean, if you bear in mind that all living creatures anticipate their breeding seasons, you know, pike move on to shallow water in the end of January, um, birds start singing uh, in January as the day starts to lengthen, and it, so is the case with barbel. And I think what the trigger, the final trigger for barbel is often the first significant rise in uh, uh, water levels or water temperatures, usually around about mid-February, and then you'll start to get fish moving. Um, and I first learnt this in 1997 when I was fishing down through a cold winter uh, down at um, Ucking Hall, down at Ripple, down at Bushley. Uh, it was a cold winter, I was picking up the odd fish throughout the winter. Uh, and then when the, when the conditions uh, improved, uh, instead of catching more fish, I started catching less fish. And yet, um, for example, Steve Pope was up at um, Beach and Court, and that year he had a huge bag of barbel. Those fish I've been fishing for down at uh, Bushley and Uckingall and Ripple uh, were on the move. I'm not saying they were all up at Beach and Court, uh, but they were certainly moving that way towards their spawning areas on the river. Um, I don't think they move as a, as a shoal. I think they're more moving uh, more as individuals with a common purpose. Um, uh, I've always remembered John Bailey describing watching a shoal of barbel on the, uh, on the, the Wensum and how a mill hatch uh, opened on the river and, and caused the flow to change under this uh, willow, uh, overhanging willow where these barbel were lying. And slowly, one by one, the barbel moved out of this swim uh, and relocated in a swim where the current was more to their liking. Um, uh, so, uh, and I think that's exactly the same situation happens on the lower seven. It, you know, it's, uh, it's replicated in, uh, on a bigger scale. And the fish are moving, uh, like I say, not as a shoal, but as individuals with a common purpose. Uh, it doesn't always happen every year, and, and some years it's more obvious than other years. Uh, I've still caught barbel down at Ucking Hall in, in, in early March, but other years, uh, it's, it's not fished well down there. I didn't do much, uh, well I didn't do any barbel fishing between the end of November uh, and, and the middle of February this year. Uh, these days I aspire to be much more of an all-rounder. Uh, however, middle of February this year uh, we had a nice warm flood uh, and a week or so later I had my first uh, trip of the year which was incidentally to Seven Stoke, um, where I'd been catching some decent fish in the autumn. Uh, however, there was half a dozen anglers on the blank, uh, and, uh, but I, I blanked that day in what I considered good conditions, uh, and judging by the lack of cars in the car park, when I got back to the car park, uh, there, was no other, there were no other cars, and I suspect that that suggested that everybody else had struggled as well. And then two days, Two days, cheers, Des. Uh, two days later, a couple of uh, fellow members of the Barbel Catchers, we had a regional meeting uh, at the Rosen Crown at Seven Stoke, and they'd also blanked there. Uh, whereas another member had been fishing further upstream at Cleveland, he'd, uh, he'd caught some fish. So I'm not saying that there were no fish at Seven Stoke, I just felt that the fish were moving and I needed to move as well. Um, so. Um, I moved upstream to a stretch that I hadn't fished for two or three years, uh, and as luck would have it, I landed on fish. Uh, I had four doubles that day, including this 13. Uh, best of all, there was nobody else on the stretch. Uh, and, and the pleasure I got from those fish was not catching the fish, but just that I'd anticipated where the fish were going to be, or where some fish were going to be, and I'd made them move, sort of thing. Uh, 
Um, again, this is my personal best barbel. I, I learnt a lot uh, when I caught this fish. Uh, it's the same fish I caught at different locations over two years and 12 miles apart. Uh, the first time I caught her, she weighed 12 pound 11 ounces, uh, opposite Campsy Church at the top, of, just above the cables. Um, second time I caught her, October 98, she weighed 15 pounds 7 ounces. Uh, uh, at the bottom end of Ripple on the Environment Agency stretch. And, what the, and when you've got the physical evidence of a fish that you've caught upstream um, and then you've caught it 12 miles downstream, you know that those fish, that, that just reinforces how much some fish are moving. I don't think all the fish are moving like that, but the, some fish do move like that. You'll get some fish that will sort of probably live, say, at Pixham most of the season, but there'll be other fish that use Pixham as a stopping off point <clears throat> in the summer, then they'll drop down further downstream, uh, and then they'll probably move back upstream. Again, the other thing I learned about this, this barbel, uh, <clears throat> back in 1998, there was some big floods at Easter, um, um, some real heavy floods uh, around about March, I think it was April, and that might have been a year, uh, and the following summer, uh, 1998, the lower seven fish very poorly. And I think that might have been a year when the barbel, had, a lot of barbel had gone over the weirs uh, at either Poic or Diglis uh, and got stuck above them and, and couldn't return until September. Well, Mike Burden had been fishing uh, downstream at Bushley for most of the summer uh, without success. Uh, and then uh, there was a bit of water went into the river, I think it was three or four foot from what I remember, in September, and Mike phoned me up and said he'd caught some fish. So I knew that the fish were moving. And in the end, I chose to fish Ripple, partly because I didn't want to tread on Mike's toes, and partly because uh, the, uh, the access from the motorway was a lot easier. But in the end, it only took me five trips to catch that fish. Uh, and I've always had the belief that those fish had only just arrived at Ripple in the previous two or three weeks. Uh, and it, it begs the question, are, are barbel more catchable when they've moved big distances? I don't know, but uh, it remains, you know, it's a personal best that, as far as I'm concerned, it can stay. Um, predators, we've, we've got seals on the seven as well as otters. However, seals have, not, have been riding the tides for years and they're not the same problem as otters. But otters do seem to be having more impact on the, on the shallow water rivers like the team than they do on the Severn. But they are certainly doing damage. Uh, and they're probably changing the behavior patterns of the barbel. Um, I mean, some people say, you know, but to say otters are not responsible for this sort of damage ignores the fact that this sort of damage was unseen 20 years ago. Um, like others, I've got hundreds of pictures of barbel from the 80s and 90s and none of them have got broken tails like this. Um, the bottom right-hand picture is a, is a team fish, and I've always, I continue to have the feeling that uh, the, the barbel, when they go into the team, they, they'll go in there and spawn, but I don't think they like hanging around as they did 20 years ago. 20 years ago, there'd be bar, uh, large numbers of barbel, particularly in the team, all through the summer months, particularly in a dry summer. Uh, it doesn't seem to have the numbers of fish uh, in the team that, that was uh, 20 years ago. Um, here's a little puzzle. Um, why has the seven failed to keep pace with the growth of barbel in other rivers? This is a September Warwickshire Avon fish, 137. Uh, this is a September Trent fish, 136. And this is a February 7 fish weighing 12 pound 10. I think we can all see the difference, so it's a lot leaner. And why do seven barbel weigh light for their, for their length? Um, I mean, I'm only speculating now, but do such fish carry higher levels of stomach parasites? I don't know, I'm not a, I'm not a biologist. I'm simply posing the question. Uh, moving away from barbel for a moment, I do get distracted by other fish in the seven, particularly by Xander. Uh, and without doubt, it is the premier Xander River in the country. 
uh, with a genuine chance of another record. But what I've always found interesting about both Barbel and Xander is how similar they are to each other. Uh, they both like warm, coloured water, they've got very similar uh, feeding habits, and they both like a good flow of water over their heads. Um, what I would say, if you ever fish for Xander, uh, uh, please use a, a wire trace, because you will catch pike. Uh, but just use your barbel rods and watch your rod tip. Uh, if you get a, a bite or a rattle, just pick your rod up and touch ledger. Uh, and if you, if, you, if you can feel the fish tugging, just strike. Uh, they don't run with baits the same as, uh, the same as pike do, but uh, I, uh, they are fascinating fish and they might even distract you from the barbel. Uh, one other puzzle, uh, the river below Tewkesbury. This is what I call the semi-tidal seven. It's only tidal with tides above 8.5 metres, which uh, are high enough to top the weirs at Gloucester uh, and then run up to Tewkesbury Weir. Um, there should be numbers of barbels below Tewkesbury Weir. There were there was numbers of barbels below Tewkesbury Weir in the 80s. There was a well-known swim opposite the point of the island that was producing six and eight pound barbel, but it's certainly not Collingham Weir these days. Uh, and there's odd locations between Tewkesbury and Gloucester that have got some inconsistent form. Uh, again, carp anglers I talk to catch the odd barbel, but not in any great numbers. And yet, they seem to be able to spawn around Gloucester. Uh, there's been small barbel around Gloucester for years, uh, most of them smaller than this five pounder. Uh, I first fished, fished for them when uh, I think it was about 2000, and most of them were sort of between one and two pounds which suggests to me that they are spawning down there, probably in the uh, uh, Lanthony Weir or Maysmore Weir. But it begs the question, where are their parents? How far down the estuary can they survive? Uh, do they move up and down over the weirs according to the tides? Um, what I would say about down here, if you ever do fish down here, beware of the tides. I learned that back in the 1980s when I was uh, shad fishing below Maysmore Weir. I'd waded out in some shallow water below the weir and a friend shouted down and said, what's that wave behind you? And I looked down and a quarter of a mile below me was the seven boar coming up towards me. I wouldn't have even heard it if he hadn't said that. Um, but to me, fishing is not about catching the biggest or the most. It's seeing it as a journey. And the longer I've fished the lower seven, the more fascinating it becomes. It's not, the river, it's not the fish I catch so much as the river I fish. And to misquote uh, Mark Twain, rumours of the death of the Lower Seven as a barbel fishery have been greatly exaggerated. It's still rolling along, producing good barbel. It remains a venue that the late Billy Lane described as the, most, the moodiest and most fascinating river he'd ever fished. Uh, Billy Lane wrote that uh, in a BAA manual in the, in the late 70s. Uh, and it remains to true today uh, for whatever fish you fish for on the Lower Seven. Thank you for listening. <laughs>